will you be sharing the slide? Just a minute. Right. So the topic given to me today was uh, Indian knowledge system. Okay. So firstly, when it comes to Indian knowledge system, we all know that we all know that we have tremendous, tremendous knowledge. Actually, I, I guess one lifetime is not sufficient for us to really understand what exactly is written. Because when I was preparing for this topic, humongous information, humongous information from all ends. So I myself took a lot of time, you know, because I could find it is a deep treasure house. Our Indian system, especially what's written in our Vedas, Vedangas, Upanishads, everything is so much, so much clear and everything is there. What we are seeing now, what we are experiencing now is already written there. It's only that we didn't have time to uh, go through it. Now, most of the times you see in a majority of the offices, we see people having Bhagavad Gita or any type of uh, Upanishad present uh, on the table with them. But tell me how exactly, how many times do we really uh, take that and read it on a daily basis? We just take it, uh, put it, uh, wipe it properly and again keep it on the table. I said that that's a very wrong habit. After uh, preparing for this talk that I have identified, I have understood that I really have to read at least two pages in a day so that we get to know what exactly is there in our uh, Vedas or Upanishads. There's so much written and only when I started preparing for this topic, in a way, I have to thank IoT Academy, uh, you know, who have given me this opportunity so that I could get back and learn what exactly is there in our uh, Vedas and Upanishads. Okay, so firstly before, because and very huge topic, it is a very huge topic given to me. So I would uh, quickly go to the next slide. Now here what's written, so we definitely uh, have to, uh, what Albert Einstein, who, who has told that we owe a lot to the Indians who taught us how to count. It was because of the, the discovery of uh, several mathematical uh, concepts, not only zero, not only binary numbers, but several, so many which I'll be discussing in the further slides, how to count without which no worthwhile scientific discovery could have been made. So this is a very huge statement for us, actually. Next slide, ma'am. So what exactly is this Indian knowledge system? So India has a rich and eternal knowledge history, which includes jnana, vijnana, and jivan darshan as its guiding principles with evolution based on experience and experiments. Now here, when I say jnana, this is a uh, Sanskrit term and it means um, spiritual knowledge where, you know, we try to understand about ourselves, self-identity. It gives us, it refers to the true knowledge of self-identity um, with the ultimate reality. That is Jnana. Vigna is nothing but, you know, Vignana we say uh, consciousness or discernment. means the ability to make correct decisions. We learn out of our experiences. So all these ones, when we read these Vedas or our Indian knowledge system, when we go through this uh, step by step, we try to develop Jnana, Vijnana and Jeevan Darshan is nothing but, you know, it's a perspective or a viewpoint, how we lead our life, how we see the eternal or philosophical truths and how we lead our life. So by uh, going deep into this Indian knowledge system, we can develop these three. That is Jnana, Vijnana and Jeevan Darshan. This will help us in uh, running our day-to-day -day life. Next slide, ma'am. Okay. Now here, firstly, uh, the Vedas. So we, we, every one of us, irrespective of our religion, we are all aware of, you know, what exactly uh, we, we infer from Vedas. It's an imperative that we regain a, a comprehensive knowledge of our heritage and demonstrate the Indian way of doing things to the entire world. Actually, uh, we, it, through this Vedas, when you have a complete insight on this Vedas, we get to know that there is a Indian way or a Bharatiya way um, that is both sustainable and strives for the welfare of all. Um, for example, if you want to become a Vishwaguru, no, normally, you know, um, most of the monkey bath 
what our Prime Minister Modi ji keeps telling that if you want to become a Vishwaguru, then definitely uh, a Vishwaguru in the sense a knowledge leader in the country, then it's very important or imperative for us to have a complete knowledge of our heritage. And, and there is always an Indian way of doing things. We have to show the entire world because it's already written in our scriptures. It's already written in our scriptures and there's all, always an Indian way of doing things. So there is a need to, you know, regenerate the mainstream Indian knowledge system for the contemporary world. Now, what I mean to tell over here is that, you know, now for instance, uh, we all know that uh, turmeric is very good. You know, to uh, whenever you have a cut or wound, turmeric is very good. It acts as an antibiotic. Okay, but no, this was not put forth by us into the modern world. Someone else has taken its patent rights, but we were doing it since long time. We do every other household in India does that, but we never went for patenting it, though it was written in our scriptures. So what I mean to say here, if you want to, uh, you know, uh, we if you want to come up in the world, if you want to become a Vishwaguru, you have to, if you want to get the title of uh, patents into your, um, into your, uh, in your, under your name, uh, for your credit, then we have to read the scripture. So there are n number of things which I have learned personally after preparing for this uh, presentation. So we have to fight and win the uh, IPO battle and we can, by learning this Indian knowledge system, by having an insight over this Indian knowledge system, uh, we get to know the application areas for immediate implementation. You get several research. We can build up research by looking into the uh, literature which is already existing here. Okay, when you read it thoroughly, you get good research ideas. And now with MEP introducing this Indian knowledge system in schools and higher education, I think so we will be good innovative leaders in the uh, upcoming years. Um, so with all this brief introduction of what exactly are the benefits of knowing Indian knowledge system is that you will always have an Indian way of doing things and presenting it to the world. Okay, the world is trying to read from our Vedas and make some innovations. But why not we, uh, as we are fortunate enough that we are born in this country, it's good that each one of us try to look into the scriptures, what we have, and try to get it out to the world, show the Indian way of uh, doing things to the world. And it is a sustainable way, right? I'm moving to the first concept that was... Uh, irrigation system and practice okay here when you come to the challenges ahead now what are the challenges ahead here you know uh, as i told you it's very difficult it's very difficult always if you see anything that's told by our uh, grandparents or by parents at home people tend to uh, not believe it to that extent rather than when you see it uh, coming out from some foreign country or some as in um, new thing if it is coming from some other place or some, if not from an other country, at least from someone else, we try to believe more. You know, so first the belief system should be developed. So that is the first and foremost thing. You have to develop a good belief system that, yes, there is concrete concepts written in our um, scriptures, which can really bring a change in the world. So what exactly is they in the scriptures only uh, is the latest discovery happening now by the foreign countries. They are utilizing our knowledge and trying to make discoveries. So first of all, you should have a, uh, you know, you change the mind mindset of the people that yes, India is rich with not only traditions, but it is also rich with good literature, which can make us proud. And, you know, uh, for that, so first of all, belief is more important. You have to change the mindset of the people. Apart from that, you know, uh, it is also how you promote it. Now that you are hearing at least a set of 20 people are listening to it, I guess you can promote this concept of Indian knowledge system to another set of 20 people. So let people start understanding that there is rich tradition and concepts in our Indian knowledge system, which can be read on daily basis and create change in the world. We can also fight uh, climate change as far as I have read this. Uh, there's so many new concepts that we can also fight climate change. Yes, ma'am, the next slide. 
so there were a lot of discussions before this drafting committee of NEP uh, sat together to draft this NEP guidelines. So there were partial discussions, but once after NEP came into existence, then they uh, started understanding because of our primitive uh, universities like Nalanda and Taxasila, where you know till date our Aribata is a uh, alumnus from this university. So where you know all these all these people, all the eminent uh, people who came. Um, from such institutions, they all dwelled upon Indian knowledge system. So there's something so concrete in Indian knowledge systems. It, it is not a hypothesis. Whatever is mentioned in the scriptures is not a hypothesis. It is a concrete statement with which you can build. And in my upcoming slides, I'll be showing you some of the you know structures which were designed long term, a long time back, and are existing till date without any. Uh, issues or problems. So the first one, next slide, ma'am. The first one is the irrigation system and practices in South India. Uh, so here, um, at that time also, we had dug wells, or you can see a well here, dug wells as usual, wells, um, small uh, tanks, reservoirs. And you know, these are the most ancient irrigation systems and practices that we had. And uh, so now also, the, the first dimension of these wells and these dams you know, of course, that time the dams were built with clay. If, if you can see the first picture, the first picture is a, um, the name of this dam is Anikat. Anikat Dam, which was uh, built uh, across the Kaveri River. Anikat Dam, it is built across the Kaveri River. Um, and the citation, if you can see, it goes back to... Rigveda. In Rigveda also, no, the earliest mention of irrigation is found in Rigveda. There, they mentioned the well style of irrigation. Only wells were used for irrigation. There was also Kupa and uh, we have learned it in our history textbook also. Kupa and Avata wells. You know, what is the speciality of these wells is that no, these wells never get dry. The, the way these wells are dug, that there is a slant feature going through down, that these wells never get dry. Means, you know, there is no evaporation. Though they are exposed to sunlight, there is no evaporation. The, the way the well is dug is in such a way that these uh, Kupa and Avata wells never get dry. And this uh, left-hand side, the first picture which you can see, that is the Anikat Dam. This is a stone laid in clay. This is a uh, dam that is built with stone laid in clay and it is um, across uh, Kaveri River. So it is also a notable ancient uh, uh, irrigation technique. This was, I guess, in the time during the Chola ruler, uh, somewhere around 200 AD. This is about the irrigation system. So now also we are using dams. The concept is the same. Might be we are not, we, we still use clay, but we are using uh, iron, iron and bricks. Okay, but the concept came from here. So the origin of the concept that there should be something called a reservoir or a well or a dam came from our uh, Rig Veda. In Rig Veda, the earliest mention of irrigation was firstly found in Rig Veda. Next slide, ma'am. Next, coming to the surgical techniques. Surgical techniques, you know, we all know Shushruta. Shushruta, you could see in the first slide is something working on the eyes. So the cataract surgery. Okay, um, Sushruta was a person, he's, um, he, he performed surgeries on nose, uh, ears, you can see even on nose, nose, ears, bladder, uh, cataract, um, then fistula, joints, hemorrhage, more than 2600 years ago without big developed surgical instruments, whatever surgical, and so there were, it was a raw form of the surgical instrument. Now we have improvised over it. So this is all again, we, we again have to thank back to our uh, sages like Shushuta, who, is, who gave us this technique. Okay, now we say if at all we're suffering with cancer, we have to go abroad to get it cured. But actually the origin of all these surgical techniques started up in India somewhere 2,600 years ago with the existing surgical instruments. You know, the first surgery was performed on a human body and it's, there is a mention of this in Rig Veda and uh, somewhere around uh, uh, 2000 um, BC, you know, where, you know, um, a prosthetic leg, that is an artificial leg was attached to a queen uh, so that she could go back, she could be, uh, she could get back to normal and participate in war. So a prosthetic, now when a person is suffering with diabetes, uh, when the sugar levels are very high, we are amputating the leg. And now we're going for a prosthetic leg. But see, it is dated back right in the Rig Veda. 
where Shushmita practiced um, putting up a prosthetic leg to a queen so that she could get back to her normal. So in the same way, you also have um, plastic surgery that was performed somewhere around uh, um, somewhere around sixth century. So plastic surgery was done somewhere around 6th century BC by Shushruta. And then, no, it was immediately, this concept of plastic surgery was immediately popularized amongst the Arabs. And then from Arabs, it came into the uh, other world. It was again launched into Europe and all. And Shushruta also, he's famous for um, his forte, his uh, nose job, that is rhinoplasty. Uh, so he had a very thorough understanding of uh, circulatory system. And even cataract surgery was also performed by Shushruta in 6th century BC. And um, uh, he did it with a special tool called, uh, he did it with a special tool called, uh, one second, I don't remember that exactly, uh, the name of the tool, one second, I'll tell you. He did it with a special tool called uh, Salaka. Salaka, Jabamukhi Salaka. Jabamukhi Salaka is a special tool that Shushruta used in those days to perform cataract surgery. It is nothing but we, this Jabamukhi Salaka is a, it's a curved needle. It's a curved needle and uh, which they remove the lens with the needle. It's a bent, it's in bent form. They remove the lens and push the cataract out of uh, the field of vision. And then this eye would be soaked with warm butter and then bandaged. So no, that was a method that they followed at that time. And so this Jabamukhi Salaka, now also you find it in your history textbooks. I have recently read, seen that also. So through this method, though this uh, method was successful, uh, Shushuta was always, uh, he said that cataract, see long time back in 6th century BC itself, he had told that only if your vision is really getting dim, you have to go for cataract. Nowadays, we see even the one who is 45 years old, 50 years old, are also when the vision is getting dim, they just go for cataract. But he said cataract should be performed only when absolutely necessary. Okay. So that was about cataract. Then this uh, slowly, you know, this process of removal of cataract, it spread from India to China and then from to the other countries. Other things, uh, what they have done was also. Uh, kidney stones, removal of kidney stones, uh, not only stones in kidney, but also stones from gallbladder. Okay, so all this was done by, you have a book uh, called uh, uh, Shushruta Samhita, which is called as uh, Shushruta's uh, Companion. Okay, this is a very famous book. We uh, Almost every other library should have this because, you know, here they describe the uh, ancient tradition of surgery in Indian medicine. It's one of the most brilliant gems in Indian medical literature. And at that time, you know, there was no anesthesia. Now we go uh, through a procedure of anesthesia before any surgery was performed. This is a highlight point here. In spite of the absence of anesthesia, complex operations were performed. Okay. Um, you, you could see in the figure, you could in the pictures that I have shown there, you could see how surgery, you, you don't, there is no big, uh, you know, what do you call... Um, there, there are all chances of a possible contamination because you know, now we wear gowns, we don't allow anyone to come there, very hygienic conditions. But you see there, there you could see three, four people just uh, operating on the individual. So the practice of surgery has been recorded in India since 8000 BC. And um, at that time, there was no anesthesia. Um, in the, Everything has been written very clear in this uh, Shushruta Samhita, as far as I remember. Um, Surgery is known as uh, Sashtra Karma. Okay, so surgery is known as Sashtra Karma and it, it has got, uh, you know, eight branches of Ayurveda. And uh, the oldest treatise dealing with surgery is the Shushruta Samhita. Okay, uh, Shushruta, he lived in uh, the now present Varanasi and uh, most of the, he, some of the other medical practitioners are Atreya and uh, one more person, Atreya and uh, one is Shushruta, Atreya and uh, Charaka. Shushruta, Atreya and Charaka. These were the other medical practitioners. So with this, what we get to see that, you know, um, in, in Shushruta Samhita, you have actually all the concepts of anatomy. Okay. So everything is mentioned very detailed, uh, in a detailed manner, or in a detailed manner in this book, uh, you know, with the aid of a dead body. 
So Shushruta was very good with rhinoplasty, actually. And he also was good with uh, removal of cataracts. That was his forte. Apart from that, you know, you have this Atreya and Charaka. They were also good with other kind of surgeries. All this is very clearly mentioned. Apart from that, now yoga, we are celebrating International Yoga Day. But long time back, yoga is a system of exercise for physical and mental nourishment. So Patanjali, you know, he sum uh, surmised this uh, process, this practice of yoga. So this is also mentioned in our literature, in our ancient literature. Yogic practices were also mentioned. So the application of yoga in physiotherapy is now gaining recognition. But long time back, this yoga, physiotherapy was all long way back mentioned in our uh, Shishrata Samhita and other ancient texts also. So this was about surgical techniques. Next slide, ma'am. Ma'am, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Next we have um art of making perfumes okay uh, so this dates back to the indus valley civilization archaeologists believe that art of making perfumes began in india during the indus valley civilization so normally how these perfumes are made we all know that from the secondary metabolites we isolate the secondary metabolites and then you have a distillation apparatus uh, so and this distillation apparatus at that time in our ancient literature, uh, during ancient days, we were using terracotta. I'm just talking something about 3000 BC. Okay, so we use terracotta as a distillation apparatus. And uh, so they have those orifices and woven material that can be squeezed out easily to uh, deliver the oil. What we do actually, we take the uh, essential oils which are present in the plants all the secondary metabolites are by the process of distillation under uh, balanced steam and pressure essential oils are released out so how this distillation process is out? nowadays we are doing it in the steel tanks right but long time back because now terracotta is quite costly but see it was done long time back in terracotta because you know terracotta uh, has pores and it is very easy for us to uh, you know squeeze out or isolate the essential oils or the fragrant oils um india was a world leader it's it is also a world leader now um, in the perfume industry you know for for a long for more than 500 years of time and uh, <clears throat> if you remember ithar Ithar, uh, the place, very famous place uh, for Ithar is Kanauj. Kanauj is a perfume capital of India because, you know, Ithar is a, um, it is a, a perfume um, which is, which, which comes from this place, Kanauj. It's more than 60,000 years old, actually. And all this, uh, you can see here that the first picture, what you can see over here is that, you know, how these are, this is a, so this is a terracotta distillation tank. Nowadays, just like a boiler, we have, how you have, if at all, there are any science participants here, how we have a big autoclave machine like that, you have this distillation tanks where perfume is prepared. Uh, but, you know, long time back, so these were those terracotta distillation tanks. This is a vessel where you can hold your perfume so this was a method how people used to prepare um, so all these things olden days but see the concept remains the same might be the material that they are using the, the source material from where we are isolating the essential oil is the same even today we are trying to isolate um, uh, lemongrass oil from lemongrass we're trying to uh, take the essence of rose from rose rose oil essence from rose so the source remains the same the procedure also remains the same the basic concept remains the same only the material long time back we used terracotta nowadays we are using either steel or um woods we are using nowadays to isolate the perfumes okay so this all these things start of making perfumes again you can see it is written in brihat samhita it is an encyclopedia which is uh, authored by uh, varahamira a sixth century Indian astronomer. Okay, a sixth century Indian astronomer who wrote the book um, Brihat Samhita. So in that book, you could you could see that you know there is actually uh, a, a, a Sanskrit and a Marathi commentary. It is a manuscript of two Sanskrit treaties and a Marathi commentary, which you know it tells us about the ingredients that are used in preparation of a perfume, the methodology of preparing a perfume. Long time back in ancient days, we used oil or water okay for infusing the botanicals whatever plant materials we have taken suppose i want to deliver uh, uh, lemon oil lemon oil from the 
peel of the lemon i used to diffuse this lemon peel in oil or water nowadays we are we have replaced this oil and water with alcohol okay because it quickly will uh, you know take away all the secondary metabolites or ingredients from the peel so only difference is that there are some minor differences in the change of the material okay otherwise the concept remains the same so we are the forerunners even in the perfume industry if we can refer to brihat samhita written by varahamira all these things are mentioned next slide ma'am yeah so this is one picture where you know these are the tanks barrels nowadays you can see such barrels that we are using it for preparation of alcohol but such barrels were used for preparation of perfumes next slide so they are all made up of mud terracotta um, vessels they are next slide ma'am hmm. now coming to the physical structures okay so here when i talk about the physical structures um if you can very clearly see here uh, uh, this is about the konark uh, sun temple sundial the second picture and the first picture is the uh, you know the minar uh, that is the iron pillar of delhi this iron pillar of delhi you know it is uh, set up by uh, uh, raja dhava raja dhava is somewhere in around uh, 4th century the siren pillar is set up in 4th century it is a structure with uh, 7.21 meters in height and uh, uh, and around uh, 41 centimeters in diameter it was constructed during the period of chandragupta maurya okay and you know it's right now you can see it in uh, delhi mehruli in delhi to the complex at mehruli in delhi you can see this and it is famous why is it famous because it is famous for its rust resistance why is it rust resistant because it was made up of wrought iron okay w r o u g h t wrought iron so this is uh, a, a, a type of iron which doesn't get rusted uh, first and foremost thing is it is made up of wrought iron and there is um, in this this the composition of this wrought iron is it is made up of more amount of phosphorus and there is total absence of sulfur and magnesium sulfur and magnesium are not there and made highly with phosphorus that is the basic reason even after i guess 16 to 1700 years it is still not getting rusted though it is exposed to air water sunlight everything so that is about one of the physical structures so see they had a mindset and all this is mentioned long time back around 4th century in our uh, structures and coming to the um, second one that is with regards to this uh, uh, sundial okay and now you know ancient indian architecture most of the time it ranges from the indian bronze age somewhere around 800 c c stands for the common era or the christian era so this physical structures whatever i'm talking is all about from the bronze age somewhere around 800 c so at that time you know what they use what were the building materials that they use they used bones such as mammoth ribs um stone metal bark bamboo clay uh, plaster many such things the first bridge the first bridge that was made at that time was simply a wooden log now bridges now also there are places where you have bridges made up of wooden logs but the, so this existence this uh, the method of constructing a bridge the with which material you can construct a bridge or what style you can construct a bridge all dates back from our ancient literature wherein you know the first bridge was made up of uh, wooden log and it was placed on a uh, across a stream and uh, and you had some timber rolls on it trackways were timber rolls so now also you see it on a railway platform very much similar to that and uh, here the famous thing of the sundial is you know the the wheel of a chariot it works as a sundial here you can see the wheel very closely from here uh, so this sundial at konark uh, sun temple in india it is built somewhere around 1250 ad okay and this uh, this is a way where this is a this sundial can tell you the time so there are totally eight spokes in the wheel 
and each spoke represents a pahar that is a pahar is a 3 hours eight spokes represent 24 hours eight trees are 24 so here in a sundial you have eight major spokes that is divided into 24 hours into eight equal parts which means that the uh, time between two major spokes is 3 hours that is one pahar okay so he, what i mean to say is that at that time you had people with such high intellect that they could uh, we we just think that it is something uh, concerned it is an artistic uh it is of artistic importance but no every other monument that was there had some significance so people had mind at that time so when you read this indian knowledge system you get to know so many um, new things which you can take forward in the form of a research you, you how much of time and coordination would have happened between the astronomers engineers and sculptors to create something like this which is existing even now 750 years back they have done which is existing now also so you have this sundial tells you the time not only when sun is falling on it even after sunset even during the sun uh, even during the night time also the sundial tells us the time okay so that is a marvel and you know it's it's something which is done 750 years back means people really had good coordination firstly and good mind okay nowadays we are in the age of you know robbing ideas from here to there but see at that time there was so much of cooperation and coordination so this physical this talks about the physical structures next slide so this, this, these also you know um, this i'll be talking uh, when i'm talking about painting and all the ajanta elora caves painting and all um we'll proceed further because there's so much to tell there's so much content here to tell i'll i'll discuss about this slide in the coming slides we can go to the next slide okay now this is about the 64 ancient arts chausat kala so this is a 64 kalas now kala means performing art which brings happiness in you so it is um kala is a term used in sanskrit and uh, most of the kalas we know here whatever the kalas are see long time back these kalas are written in our history and now we are living it now we are living these kalas which was already recorded in our history we are now living it so sharda devi is uh, known as a goddess of kala and each kala is very innate or uh, you know um, personal to a human being now for example you see in this kala if i mean to say that um, art of conversation the 52nd one samvadya okay now we are having uh, our intonation and then voice modulation but this came long time back so these are only the titles that i have given you here but if you uh, look into read about all these in detail now we are having a we are, we are earning a livelihood with all these 64 colors but all these 64 colors were told to us long time back so it is already registered or documented in our uh, ancient literature you now you can see the 32nd 36th one art of carpentry takshana it is already mentioned we are making a livelihood by learning this takshana so like that you know whatever 64 are there all now this gymming also whatever we are going and doing uh, uh, building body all this is also mentioned long back so like that right from geeta vidya that is art of singing till the last one vyayama vidya that is art of exercises and yoga what we are going to the gym and doing everything is already pre mentioned in our history in our ancient literature so if we go through that we will be the forerunners in making discoveries in today's world rather than giving chance to the foreign countries that's why the government has made it mandatory that all the school students and college students can have an awareness about indian knowledge system next one ma'am ship building now ship building this is construction of ships what was the reason that they wanted to go for ship building for trade definitely for trade so this ship building what picture that i have shown you is from 3 millennium bc in harappan times that is during indus valley civilization the harappans built the first tide block of the world you know for bathing and servicing now you are having a harbor where all the ships can come and stay and some servicing of the ships can done so this was planned long time back during the harappan times only that is during indus valley civilization then somewhere around 2500 in a place called lothal 
ships were serviced now what we are doing in the harbors long time back somewhere around 2500 bc only in a place in a port town of lothal l o t h a l such servicing of ships was done so this is all existent in our history in a period of 3000 bc to 2000 bc you know india had a very rich ship building culture then it went down for a period of time that is from uh, 2000 bc to 600 bc we didn't do much better but again from 600 bc to 19th century that is till date ship building flourished in india early sea faring people you know they constructed small boats and rafts for transportation fishing and trading um so in that way they started but all this also all this emerged from our uh, harappan times ancient boat building methods you know you have different uh, boat building methods like it's called uh, um, hide log soon uh, clinker shell fast shell first and frame first right now we are following the frame first technique so all these techniques which i told you already it is existing in our literature during the harappan times also we followed these uh, building methods to construct a ship so one of the method is still followed till date that is the frame first technique frame first technique is a method which is followed till date for modern ship construction industry next one ma'am yeah coming to dyes and painting techniques in now dyes and painting techniques no india is expertise in natural dyes you know it dates back to ancient times um, even in vedas vedas also it's all natural dyes but hmm? uh, so <clears throat> you know weaving and um, design printing on fine textiles they form a part of our uh, tradition india has a virtual monopoly i can say virtual monopoly in the production of uh, dyed painted and printed textiles for a long time um, so You you have you no know, this every other region like you have block prints coming from uh, Gujarat and you know <clears throat> Deccan prints. Uh, so every other state now has got a particular type of uh, printing style. So all this also dates back to our uh, olden days. You know wherein uh, uh, dyes were extracted from vegetables. Now for example, you from the bark of uh, um, even now. even now also but though they are all very expensive but long time back also dyes were um, ice, uh, extracted from leaves barks um, roots of trees and plants you you can see uh, shades of blue comes from the indigo plant black from the myrobalan plant and uh, ranges of this uh, uh, red lilac burgundy all from madder indian mulberry indian mulberry and lac insects they were long lasting dyes now also we are using this indian mulberry for production of dyes so this again the indian mulberry and lac insects this idea again came back from the ancient literature only so long back also we used this indian mulberry and lac insects as a uh, source of dye even today indian mulberry is a leading source of dye then coming to the painting indian painting Mm, you can see well, the figure which i have shown here it has a very long tradition and history in indian art the earliest uh, um, indian paintings were rock paintings of prehistoric times such as it, it was called petrogil uh, it was found in places like bimbetka rock shelters it's a very site good uh, you know um, revenue earning site seeing place bimbetka rock shelters and some of the stone age rock paintings are found in this bimbetka rock shelters so all these paintings are some 10000 years old even the paintings that you see in ajanta caves of course some of them have got disturbed now it's been um, uh, you know not demolished but it's been uh, withered it's been with her but all these ajanta caves and bimbetka rock shelters all these are marvels of our ancient history in actually indian paintings you can classify it into three types it is called uh, murals uh, miniatures and painting on cloth these are the three which is also mentioned in rigveda indian painting is classified into three types murals miniatures and cloth paintings it is mentioned in rigveda and uh, murals are large works which are executed on the walls of uh, solid structures what all you can find in ajanta caves no ajanta caves and one more place of kailashnath temple even in kailashnath temple also you can find these murals and miniature paintings you know you can find them on very uh, it's it's all small scale you can find it on books or albums 
uh, such as paper and cloth so like that you have but the whenever we talk about paintings we should never uh, forget to talk about ajanta caves which date from 5th century okay and uh, next coming to science and technology ma'am next slide yeah so here th this slide will take a long time because we've really done immense work here science and technology the first one is so first you can see shushruta treating so all that we have covered in surgery so which i have not covered in surgical procedures i'm going to cover here in science and technology so first one is about uh, mathematical digit zero okay so this was put forth by it was a it is an important invention by aryabhatta in his book also you can mention the essence of this uh, zero so if there is no zero there is no mathematical calculation at all and then once zero developed and uh, this uh, he created a symbol for zero and it was through his efforts that all the other mathematical operations like addition subtraction they started using this digit zero so that was the first uh, invention of zero by aryabhatta then also the decimal system came into existence you know wherein you have this uh, what can i say ingenious method of expressing all numbers by means of 10 symbols okay each symbol received a value of position B because of this decimal notation no we have this uh, facilitated calculation okay and so all the mathematics in practical inventions became much faster with the exist with the invention of decimal system it led way to other inventions okay and then you also have numerical notations one to nine this all dates back whatever i'm speaking now dates back to 500 bc okay so numerical notation notations means where every number from one to nine was given a symbol symbol is symbol one two three four like that these symbols were given by indians only okay this notation system was later on adapted by uh, adopted by uh, arabs and then they gave that hin numerals h i n d hin numerals what we have read and then centuries later then you have these arabic numerals because of trading and all no arabic numerals came into existence but the basic numerical notation 1 to 9 was given by indians then the concept of binary system okay there is binary num binary numbers it, it is a basic uh, language in which computer programs are written binary uh, refers to a set of two numbers zero or um, zero and one and so it's a combination which are called as bits and bytes we are all aware of it so the binary number system so this this is now we are reading it in our computer books but see all this is derived from our ancient literature the binary number system was first uh, described by um, um, the vedic scholar pingala pingala described about binary number system it was written in his book called uh, um, chandra Has chandra shastra <clears throat> okay so wherein you know actually in this uh, um, chandra shastra it, it you have all uh, it is a prosody it is a prosody where you have in in sanskrit where there is a study of poetic verses so apart from that you also have this binary numbers the concept of zero and one this was put forth by pingala in this book then uh, the use of ruler is a scale to make measurements in inches or in centimeters all this also again dates back to uh, the harappan era you know so in the harappan era also how they started measuring came back with the concept called ruler or linear measurement uh, so they were using scales which were made of ivory and shells now we are using a plastic ruler or a wooden ruler or a <coughs> uh, steel ruler <coughs> excuse me but long time back they used ivory and shell to measure so the concept of uh, linear measurement by using a scale or a ruler dates back to harappan civilization then other things um, 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 yeah very very important thing was about uh, kanad okay so here kanad uh, he he came up with the concept of atomic theory what are atoms and how one atom combines to another atom can give rise to a molecule so actually now in the science textbook we give the credit to john dalton but i guess before john dalton was born kanad came devised this atomic theory long back so what 
so where are we lacking now because we didn't go through our indian knowledge system we didn't revise our um, literature which is already documented in our uh, vedas or vedangas upanishads we didn't go through it that's the reason we are left back we are not making some discoveries but all this is already done by our ancient people if we read them on daily basis definitely we are going to take up india to a higher level so uh, kanad already talked about atomic theory but we didn't get the um, patent rights for it in fact that uh, discovery the credit of that discover invention not discovery invention the credit of that invention went to john dalton so why because we never bothered to know about what was written in our indian literature so kanad was a pers- uh, kanad um, and he is a notable scientist who talked about atomic theory he this atom was known as anu or a small indes- indes- in the literature it is written anu which is a small indestructible particle and how these uh, he also stated that anu can have two states one is a rest state and one is a uh, state of motion and that uh, atoms of the same substance when they combine with each other in a specific and synchronized manner they will give rise to molecules that is called uh, it was called uh, davyanuka davyanuka trivyanuka okay so so your molecule your molecule is nothing but anu is your atom uh, molecule is called uh davyanuka and uh, triatomic molecule is called trivyamuka so all this is already existing in our literature we didn't happen to read that so now at least with the advent of new education policy by imbibing this concept of uh, indian knowledge system into the schools and colleges the government that we make some good discoveries in the field of science and technology Uh, the next thing is uh, next other discovery you can see in the picture in the bottom line here you can see all these uh, uh, instruments so these are all the raw forms but you can see just like a caesar or a cutting plier or a tong all these are also latest discoveries and all these were made with wood steel so wood steel it is a steel alloy mix it was developed in india and uh, it is a crucible steel you know which is characterized by a pattern of bands that was known in ancient world by different names such as you know it was called sirik iron as far as i remember sirik iron hindwani all these and the famous uh, um, damascus sword you know which can also tear open the hair which can also cut the hair cut the hair or cut uh, uh, you know cleave a free uh, silk scarf damascus sword is very very famous so that time that uh damas now we are learning about one, with the advent of nanotechnology as a new science we are learning about damascus sword and all but long time back in our literature damascus sword this um, wood steel was mentioned your damascus sword is made up of wood steel so long time back it was existing in our literature we didn't happen to read that now with the advent of nanotechnology we started learning about what is wood steel and in, in which way this damascus sword is so important what are the contributions of this damascus sword we started learning now okay so that's it. these are some of the science and technological inventions i was actually while well, there's so many n number of uh, examples given uh, but i was always worried whether i could finish up in the given period of time so these are some of the latest science and technological inventions that i have taken another one which you can see the essence of uh, cow's urine oh, so now all it is written in our uh, literature but now cow's urine to treat diabetes cow's urine to treat vertigo cow's urine to treat some types of cancer now we are talking about it but the existence of all this is dating back to our ancient literature next slide ma'am that's it so i just the, the topics that were allotted to me based on that how it is already existing in our literature and how we are trying to bring it further so if we read our indian literature on a regular basis if we at least have some insights on it i guess we will uh, definitely put our country on the front line if anyone has any doubts they could ask me as far as i 